The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. A man was going on a journey, called in his servants, and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the five additional. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come, share your master's joy. Then the one who received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him, reply, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter. Should you not have put my money in the bank so that I could have got back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the darkness outside where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, we heard a powerful witness a couple weeks ago from Charlene Farrell on stewardship of time, the value of time. Last week, we heard a witness from Leanne Parker on stewardship of talent, where she was reminding us about how we all have talents and how she was so reluctant to use her talents initially but changed in her thinking and this weekend I've got the unimitable task of teaching the stewardship of treasure I can tell you right now no Catholic priest wants to talk about money but however the church has given me the perfect backdrop with this gospel which I just proclaimed from Matthew 25 it's also found in Luke chapter 19. And it's the details that do not quite translate well into English that make this story so important. First of all, we're told we have a wealthy landowner. He's a very successful man, and he's going off on a business venture. Before he goes, though, he calls in three of his servants, and he gives them each talents, we're told. What's a talent? Well, once again, that's one of those words that's lost in translation. But basically, in the Hellenistic world, it was the largest sum of money that one could imagine. In fact, one talent was the amount of money you'd pay to a common labor, laborer for 15 years of work. So think about it. The guy that got the five talents got enough money to pay him for 75 years labor. It was huge. But notice a key phrase that's so often overlooked in this passage. The master gave each of the servants according to his ability. The master knew what they were capable of and he trusted these servants. 
And that's why he gave over this large amounts of money and then left town. Well, he came back and he called him in for an accounting. The man who got five doubled his talents. The man who got two doubled his talents. But then there was the third guy who got only one talent, but still a huge amount of money. He was scared of the master, and he tells the master, I buried it in the ground for safekeeping because I was afraid of you. And so the master looks at him and he is furious. Why? Because he would not take a risk. He would not go out on faith to do what the master wanted him to do. The master even looks at him and says, you know, you could at least take the money and put it in the bank so that I've got interest on my return. And the bottom line is, Jesus would not use those words today because he would not want us to put our money in the bank for interest sake. But back then, it did pay interest. So the man is punished. What he has is taken away from him, it's given to the men who have, and the guy is thrown out of the kingdom of God. It's no mystery that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in this passage. He's reminding us that we all have been given treasure in this life, and we are called to produce with it, and we will be judged based on what we do with this treasure. So what can I tell you about the stewardship of treasure? Well, first of all, we have to get realistic about the meaning of money. For most of us, it's a difficult thing to contemplate because I'm always here and the economy's bad, people are, are having tough times and so on and so on. And I'm sure there are plenty that are. But the bottom line is, we've got to remember one thing. God doesn't need our money. God does not need our money. Often we fall into that thinking that somehow he does. I give to the church to further God's work because God needs my money. What does God need that we could possibly have? He gives us everything. So what are we going to try to do? Up God? No, what's important about money and what God judges us on based on our use of money is the attitude of the heart. Are we cheerful givers, as St. Paul says in his second letter to the Corinthians? Do we give unbegrudgingly or are we stingy? Are we stingy in every dimension of our lives? You know, you hear a lot of talk when it comes to stewardship of treasure about tithing, especially those of you who are lifelong members of the Capital County community. We are surrounded by biblical fundamentalists for whom when they talk about money in the church, they talk about tithing. And what I'd like to share with you, that is a grossly inadequate way of looking at stewardship of treasure. A number of years ago, I flew around the country on behalf of the National Catholic Stewardship Council giving talks on stewardship to dioceses and archdioceses and a few parishes around the country. And I was amazed that most people, when they heard talk about treasure, they thought about tithing. So what's the big deal about tithing? What's the proper understanding of tithing? Well, there's no doubt that the word tithe means a tenth, ten. 10%. The Hebrew word root ma'asar simply means 10. But you see, once again, the problem is a misunderstanding. Tithing is not about how much money you give. Tithing is about the way that you give your gift. You see, back in ancient times, people tithed. You see many references to tithing in the book of Deuteronomy, for instance. But here's what it meant for them. When you brought your gift to the temple, when you gave to God, you always gave God the first portion of what you harvested. You gave God the best up front and first, and not the loose over left change. 
Or in other words, if I was a barley farmer, I gave him the first fruits of my barley. If I was a produce, a fruit farmer, I gave him the best of my fruit. If I was, if I was a herder, I gave him the fattest cattle that I could give him. I gave him always the best and up front. But you see, unfortunately, we get that backwards. We give God what's left over after everything else is taken care of, including our entertainment and leisure. I always say to people, it's a good thing God doesn't give us the leftovers or none of us would be around here today. So what is the attitude of your heart when you give? Do you give God up front? Do you give God the best? Do you give God with a pure heart? And do you give God in a planned way, not just sporadically, but as a part of your obligation of showing thanksgiving to God for what he has given us first? Those are the issues that factor in on the concept of tithing. Now, I passed out a number of envelopes this weekend, and especially at the beginning of this Mass. I would ask those people who received envelopes to please open them up at this time. Those in the choir loft received envelopes from Tony Cavalier. I delegated him to go up there. The contents of these envelopes is nothing more than putting into real life what that gospel is talking about. I withdrew $5,000 from my personal account, and it's from the account that I had money put back to bury myself. And so what I wanted to do was to put faith in you and trust you to do something with this. Now, you've got six months to do something with the sum in your envelope, whatever it may be. We will ask you to return what you have done with this in six months, May 27th, on the Feast of Pentecost, the birthday of the Catholic Church. And what can I do with that money in the envelope? Well, you can do like the third guy did in the Gospel, bury it in the ground, or just put it in the bank. You won't get any interest there for sure. Or you can do what happened a number of years ago up in Wheeling. I had a good friend up there who owned several funeral halls, and we enjoyed one another's company even on funerals. And every time when we were coming back from the cemetery after a burial, he would always say to me as his custom, Father Jim, is there anything you need? To which I always responded, no thank you, Jim. It's very kind of you to offer. Well, one day he was driving me back from a funeral and I was getting ready to exit his car. He said to me, as he always did, Father Jim, do you need anything? And I looked at him and I said, Jim, as a matter of fact, yes. I'd like for you to loan me $10,000 cash for six months without interest. And he looked at me, as you might imagine, like I need my head examined. And he said, okay. And then it got quiet for a few seconds, and then he looked at me and he said, may I ask what you're going to do with it? And I looked at him and I said, I'm going to give it away. And he laughed. A few days later, he brought the 10000 in in cash and various sums. And I put it inside 163 envelopes. This family right here remembers that well because they were up in the parish with that happened. Did you get an envelope? No, they didn't get an envelope. Well, you got one now. <laughs> one of our students who was a seventh grader at the time, his name is Nick Maltese. Do you remember Nick? Nick got $5 in his envelope. Nick took the $5 and went to Walmart and bought a case of Pepsi. And then he sold it at the basketball games that the school had in the evenings. He doubled his money just like that. He bought more Pepsi and then he added to his menu snacks and then little cookies and things like that. After several months of buying and selling and buying and selling, Nick was able to raise enough money to buy three good snow shovels and a bunch of salt for de-icing. In six months, 
Nick turned five dollars into five hundred dollars. And here's the kicker. Nick got his face on the cover of that trashy star tabloid. You know, the one that was always talking about Jennifer Lopez and, and, and Lindsay Lohan and all that kind of stuff. There he was. I wouldn't have believed it if someone hadn't bought one and shown me. Here's Nick on the front cover holding up five $100 bills with a big smile on his face and a peace sample. It was amazing what Nick did. Nick today owns a sports business. The principles he learned through that project taught him how to work and be successful. So what are we going to do here with this 5000 Well, at the end of six months, I need my burial money back unless any one of you wants to step forward and offer to bury me when, when, I, when I leave this world. I don't plan on leaving anytime soon. But everything we raise over that 5000 is going to go directly to the poor. We have a special fund here in this parish called the Stewardship Account for the Poor in which we distribute much, much money. In fact, we have been told multiple times by agencies who know that no church in Cabell County contributes more for the poor than Our Lady of Fatima. That's a fact. And if you want to see some of the examples, there's an insert in today's bulletin from information and referral that just cites some of the very pathetic cases that we managed to help out. Why do I do this? Because I love this gospel parable. Why do I want to help the poor? Because I, all of us, are going to be judged on what we did for the poor. When did you see me hungry and feed me? When did you see me naked and clothe me? When did you see me thirsty and give me drink, says Jesus? As long as you did it for one of these least, you did it therefore for me. So my brothers and sisters, we must remember, treasure is a part of our lives. What we do with that determines how we spend our eternal life. For the people who got the envelopes, let's pray. Let's pray that God will give them strength and creativity to do what they need to do. But let us pray for all of us. May God reward us for what we have done for his poor. May we continue to do even more. And may we know that when we take care of the least in God's kingdom, we are taking care of Jesus Christ himself.